So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first fierce mini talk. Uh, this is a series. This is our second year doing it now, um, and the idea is we want to introduce people to some of the fierce women of history uh, as part of our Women's History Month uh, events. So this year's theme, we're doing women rebels and adventurers. Uh, so today's talk is going to be, be about Junko Tabe. Um, and Junko Tabe is actually a hero of mine. I've always been interested in mountaineering. I've never actually wanted to do it myself, but I've always found it to be a very fascinating subject. Um, and Junko Tabe is really interesting because she was actually the first woman uh, to summit Everest and the first woman to complete the seven summits of mountaineering, which we'll talk about today. So she was born in 1939 in Miharu in Fukushima in Japan. And if that name sounds familiar, that is where they did have uh, the deadly tsunami um, in 2011. Um, and Fukushima has always been a rural area of Japan. It's not near any major cities. It's very uh, naturalistic. And that's where she was introduced to climbing. Um, as a child, she was always very small and sort of fragile. Her family had a lot of history um, of pneumonia and other illnesses. Uh, so a lot of people were very surprised when she turned out to love climbing and hiking. Um, but one of her teachers in elementary school said he would take the students on a climbing trip uh, to a no nearby peak in northern Japan called Nasudake. Um, and the whole idea was they carried everything with them. They camped out overnight, climbed to the top. And I have a quote from her. She said, I was treated to a view from the top that was unlike anything I had ever seen. I was much higher up in the mountains that surrounded my, than, than those that surrounded my home. Uh, it triggered an awareness that there are many things in the world for me to discover. So it really was um, a very pivotal moment in her life. No matter what other interests she pursued, she always had this deep respect for nature um, and being outdoors. In her family, her father was very, um, very interested in pursuing his children's education. A lot of students in her town completed middle school and then went on to work or uh, start families, but she actually completed high school and went on to university. Um, she attended Showa Women's University in Tokyo, and she found that when she went to Tokyo that being in such a big city was actually a big shock for her. She had a number of times where she was very depressed um, and found it hard to live in the city, and her father actually encouraged her to take a break from school and spend time outside going hiking, sort of gaining her strength back up. And she found that that gave her relief. So even when she started school again, even though she had that depression, she was able to spend time outdoors. She found a book about the mountains near Tokyo uh, and spent her weekends climbing. And that's when she actually joined her first mountaineering club. Um, so she joined a student group, but she also climbed alone because Many of the mountains in that area were not very dangerous and could basically hike them. So once she graduated, she said that she became excited and happy with planning her next climb and the next and the next, one after the other. Each trip had a purpose, and what, le what elated me most was the fact that if I kept walking, no matter how fast or slow, I would arrive at a place I had never been before. So after she graduated from college, uh, she joined a women's climbing club and began to learn how to do rock climbing. So before she had mostly been doing hiking, now she was learning how to use um, the different tools uh, to do rock climbing and mountaineering. Um, they call white mountain climbing, that means climbing mountains that are covered in ice and snow, um, ones like Everest, which are permanently covered. Um, so she eventually joined the Rioho Climbing Club um, which was dedicated to climbing edge, cutting edge climbing in Japan. Um, and she was one of the few female climbers at that time and she got a lot of pushback. Um, that's part of why she joined that club because the climbers there, even the men, they were just were looking for somebody who was a good climber. Didn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Um, but she did find a lot of prejudice. She said, despite my hard earned competency in the mountains, I sometimes felt other male climbers gave me the once over at the crags while saying, this is no place for women. My commitment was to climb, and I loathed the idea of having to spend a Sunday sitting idle rather than being on a mountain. So in 1964, Junko met Masunobu Tabe, who is a fellow climber. Uh, her story was she climbed up to the top with a friend of hers um, that she climbed with, and he was up there and he had made like desserts for everybody who was coming up the mountain um, at the end. So they spent their first date climbing and a lot of their courtship climbing and ended up getting married in 1966. 
Um, they ended up having two kids. She actually had her first kid three years before she attempted Everest. Um, and she always said one of the wonderful things about her husband was that he was willing to let her be the climber. He would take care of kids, he would cook meals, which in Japan, even in the 60s, was that was not something that men did. Um, that was something women did, but he uh, was willing to put her needs and her climbing expertise um, before those sort of stereotypes. And that's her when, as a young woman climbing uh, in Japan. In 1969, Junko was contacted by a climber named Jushika Wakayama. Um, she was an experienced climber and had been part of the first female ascent on the north face of the Matterhorn in Switzerland. Um, and she was seeking out experienced female climbers in Japan to become part of a women-only climbing team uh, that was going to lead an expedition in the Himalayas. Um, so they chose to climb Annapurna 1, uh, and that's an elevation of about 26,000 feet. Um, and so this was sort of an attempt to discover, like, can we put together a team that is all women? Can we successfully climb in the Himalayas? Um, and they were successful, even though there was a lot of press about, like, why are these women doing this? Why aren't they climbing a lower peak? Uh, they proved that they could do it. She said, the snow on the summit was rock hard, deflecting my ice axe when I tried to dig in with its pick. Every movement was slowly executed. I placed my pack down and peeled off my overmitts. The wind jabbed at my hands like needles. Carefully slipping flags from a plastic bag, we tied them off on our axe handles. The Nepali one by Jimmy, the Japanese one by me, and the team flag by Hirakama. We're finally here, it's done. The temperature was recorded at negative 16 degrees Celsius. The time was 2.45 p.m. So that was one of her first uh, major summits. And she talks in her book, which I encourage you to read, um, about what and what a feeling it was after all the work uh, to finally reach the top of the summit. So in 1970, that team decided that the next mountain they wanted to climb was going to be Everest. So at that point in time, Everest had relatively few summits. I believe it was 37. Um, and no woman had successfully summited the mountain. So the team applied for permits from uh, the Nepali government, but initially they were offered another peak. They said, well, why don't you try this other one? And they said, no. And they said, okay, well, then you're not getting a permit this year. Uh, so they kept applying um, and waiting another year, saying, look, the only permit we want is for Everest. We don't want a lesser peak. So finally, in August of 1972, their 14-woman climbing team was given an Everest permit for 1975. So she said, in February 1974, one year before departure to the Himalayas, we held a winter training camp at Gaki Dake, which is a peak in Japan. Um, on a snowy day, we broke trail in knee-deep powder the entire way from the train station to the mountain summit. There I finally witnessed what the team had to offer, 13 women setting a solid pace uphill with no complaints. A renewed strength bubbled up and filled my entire body, convincing me that yes, we would achieve our goal on Everest. I often drew from the feeling of that day to get us to the summit. So in 1975, they headed uh, up to base camp in the Himalayas. Um, this is a quote, I won't read the whole thing this time, um, about how they prayed with their Sherpas for a successful climb. She said, her silent prayer was, please let us maintain the same number of people on the way up and on the way down, and may success on the summit also be granted. Um, so one of the things that she was most worried about uh, there had been a very unsuccessful push in 1970 by a Japanese team of male climbers um, in which eight people had died on the mountain. So her goal was not was to get to the summit, but also to successfully bring uh, everyone who went up back down. So on April 3rd, 1975, the team passed the dangerous Kumbu Icefall um, and established their first camp on the mountain. Um, so it's very important in climbing to establish a variety of camps, especially on Everest. This is where you stash food, supplies, oxygen. Um, it gives you a place to go in case somebody gets sick. So they established their first camp on the 3rd. On the 8th, they established their second camp. Uh, now their Sherpas pointed out a location for them to camp um, in this area, saying it had been used by several teams the previous season. Um, but they noticed that there was a lot of trash. There had been like leftover tents and cardboard and garbage. So they decided they would move about 15 meters away from that campsite to one that wasn't as dirty. Uh, and this ends up becoming very 
important because as they were working to establish their routes up the mountain to camps three and four, one of their climbers became ill with altitude sickness. Uh, so Junko and several other members of the team escorted her back down to camp two so that the Sherpas could take her back down to base camp where she could get some help. And that's really important because in the wee hours of May 4th, 1975, an avalanche broke free above Camp 2. Several members of the team were injured, including Junko, but nobody died because the main impact of the avalanche landed upon the previous year's campsite. So if they hadn't chosen to change locations for the campsite, they probably would have perished. Um, so they were forced to wait a week to heal um, for everyone to get back in enough strength to make an attempt on the summit. And this is very dangerous on Everest because there's a very limited climbing window. Um, that's caused by monsoons. If you've ever heard of the monsoons in India, uh, they start up in the Himalayas. So that's when a lot of snow, ice, water is going to come, and that makes it impossible to climb. So waiting a week means watching that window of time to make it to the summit get smaller and smaller. Uh, so here's a quote from her. She said, first silence, then a whole body vibration a deafening noise and wham, impact, avalanche. Before I knew it, I was tumbling fast. Then stillness and an unrelenting pressure that pinned me down so I could hardly breathe. I felt suffocated. I desperately sought escape as I reached for my knife. Everybody okay? I yelled at the top of my voice, startled by its loudness. There was no response. Luckily, everyone was all right. So because of the limited climbing window, um, and the uh, injuries and illnesses that had gone through in the team, on May 10th, the team announced that there would be finalists chosen for the climb. So out of their 14-person team, uh, they had to select, in this case, three climbers to make the final push to the summit. Um, and Juko was selected as one of those climbers. On May 12th, they had some more altitude illness among the team's Sherpas. That led to the decision that only one climber from their team could make their way to the summit. That was the only uh, attempt that they were going to be able to make successfully with their supplies and their crew. So the team made a decision and it was Junko Tabe. Um, and she was always very self-effacing and she said, no, it should be someone else. And they said, you're the one who has been strong. You're the one who has kept us going uh, during this expedition. It should be you. So on May 16th, 1975, she woke at dawn to cover the final distance to the summit. It took her six and a half hours um, by climbing up past a knife edge ridge uh, with thousands of feet of fall on either side. But at 12.30 p.m. that day, Junko and her Sherpa, Ang Tsering, reached the summit of Mount Everest. Here's a picture of her at the summit. She was the 38th person to summit Everest, um, and it was 22 years after Sir Edmund Hillary made the first ascent. So after Everest, she continued climbing, and one of the things that she worked towards was the seven summits. Uh, so the seven summits are known as the highest mountains on each continent, including Antarctica. Um, she completed them in 1992. She was the first woman to do so and the 19th person overall. Um, and then I put a list of the mountains uh, that she climbed. So Everest is the tallest out of all of the mountains, as you can see in this uh, image here, showing the heights of all of those. But each of the mountains has their own separate uh, pitfalls. Um, in some places, there, some are easier. In Antarctica, it means traveling and outfitting to go to Antarctica um, and being able to supply yourself for the entire climb. So one of the things uh, that Junko noticed during her climb on Everest was that they were leaving everything behind. They used supplemental oxygen to climb, and what that meant is when you used up a tank, they would just dump it along the side of the path they were climbing. Um, they would also leave their trash behind, they would leave tents behind. Um, and as she climbed down, she realized how much they really had left. Uh, so one of the things that she became very um, sort of adamant about was climbing without destroying the mountain. Um, she said, there's no point in having this mountain that we want to climb and then having to go past piles of trash on the way up. Uh, so one of the things she did was started organizing cleanup climbs, and the idea is that you have people who would climb up certain mountains, even the lower parts of Everest, not with the intention of trying to summit the mountain, but of trying to go and find the trash that people have left and pack it up and take it back down so that in the future, people who climb, it'll be like the first climbers. You won't have to see uh, all the remnants of things that were left behind by previous climbers. Here's a picture of her climbing.
Um, so Junko Tabe passed away in 2016 at the age of 77. Um, she died of stomach cancer, but she continued to climb even into her 70s. Um, and her final climb was the summer before she died. Um, it was Mount Fuji in Japan. And it was part of an annual event that she created to introduce young people to mountaineering, to have the same effect on younger people that someone that her teacher did on her uh, by leading them into discovering what mountaineering is about um, and having this expedition. And there's a picture of her. And then I'll leave you with one final quote. Even with everything she faced uh, in starting her mountaineering career as a woman, um, she said, there was never a question in my mind that I wanted to climb that mountain, and no matter what other people said. And that was Mount Everest, and she became the first woman to do it because she didn't let what other people said stop her from reaching her goals.